Welcome to Tibetscapes Conversations. This is a podcast hosted by Tibetscapes. Tibetscapes is a research collective focused on Tibet and the Himalayas. We are based in the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Today, we have with us Dr. Alexander Davis. Dr. Davis is a lecturer in international relations at the School of Social Sciences at the University of Western Australia. He has a PhD in international studies from the University of Adelaide and a postdoctoral fellowship from La Trobe University. Dr. Davis's research builds on critical and historical perspectives and is centered on international relations in South Asia. His ongoing research focuses on histories and geopolitics in India's borderlands. Today, we will be discussing his newly published book, The Geopolitics of Melting Mountains and International Political Ecology of the Himalaya. It was published in 2023 by Palgrave Macmillan. Through the book, Dr. Davis reimagines the Himalayan region through the conceptual framework of international political ecology, and he examines the interrelations between international politics, geological processes, local political formations, borderland cultures, and the more than human ecology of the region. Treating ecologies as agential actors in politics, Dr. Davis explores how rising mountains and shifting river streams shape geopolitics and how increasing militarization in turn impacts regional and global ecological processes as well as local communities. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you very much, Madara. It's great to be here. So I just want to kick off by asking you, uh, because the international political ecology is inherently an interdisciplinary framework, what is the significance of interdisciplinarity for studying the Himalaya? The main utility, I think, from this approach comes from my own studies with international relations and then some of my my personal frustrations with the discipline that, uh, that I know lots of colleagues share as well. Um, so I come from a history background initially, and I trained in research methods in history, and then I came to international relations for my my PhD, and that's where I've sort of built built my career. Um, and I think this interdisciplinarity is useful for studying this region because of some of those struggles that I think I've I've had with international relations. What the IR approach gives us is a state-based reading of the region. It's an approach that just looks at state actors and it tends to just ask one question primarily. Will they, will those state actors fight with one another or will they cooperate with one another? Um, under what context will that happen? How does tensions in one area, say the Indian Ocean, spill over into India-China tensions in the Himalaya? These types of questions. So that, and I do think that's an important part of this story but it has a couple of other effects as well. It naturalizes the border conflicts. It strips any of the colonial history of those borders. How did they get there? Out of its analysis, not, not all of it does this. Post-colonial IR does a really good job of reading those border conflicts, but it's still just the traditional IR approach is still just leaving us with India, China, Pakistan, Nepal, and, and Bhutan. That is clearly an important part of the story in the Himalaya. State actors are increasing their influence, they're militarizing more and more regions, they're contesting the highest peaks and the most fragile ecological areas in the Himalaya as well, and they are also fighting over its water resources. There's been a lot of work on um, the possibility of water wars in the, in the Himalaya. But I think that is a very limited reading, ultimately. It takes agency away from Himalayan communities, it turns the region into something that should be studied from the plains, from capital cities like Delhi and Beijing. And I think it ultimately it takes away what is unique and interesting and unusual about the region as well. Political ecology research, I think, can help to address those problems. It tends to look at a much broader global scale. So that might be uh, earth systems, global capitalism, transnational actors, the global environment as a whole, and then how those systems play out in very local, small environmental regions. And that means that for the most part, political ecologists have tended to avoid focusing that much on the level of the state. They tend to look at small scale environmental regions and then patterns of oppression, resource extraction, conflict environments in smaller contexts. So I think that's really useful. 
but at the same time that can't quite capture the geopolitical situation in the Himalaya as a whole while also zooming in on while also taking into account localized regions so that's what I I think this is helpful for what struck me uh, just as you were responding as well is the idea of scale right like you have the state scale and then you have the larger global processes but you also have within the state local processes local community level processes that are underway and that really makes me wonder how does a multi scalar approach to the himalaya rather than treating this as a uh, interstate looking at the multi scalarity of the analysis what does that do to extend our understanding of the region that yeah that does follow very nicely from what i've just been talking about it gives us the opportunity to combine a panoramic understanding of the region's issues while also taking into account those gradated differences across different parts of the region i think this approach also helps us sidestep questions of which state is most at fault uh which you often get in international relations discourse you get this discussion of who's the worst actor who can we who can we blame which actor is the most responsible for this and i think it helps us to understand how the imposition of a state based system around the world that kind of originated from the plains of europe has affected a mountainous region that is particularly difficult for states to control it shows us the way that ecological systems of the himalaya are interacting with the states with the international state system which are which are, which demand sort of territorialized states and fixedness so i think that's one thing that it helps us do i think it also helps us enable comparisons across the himalaya while bearing in mind that panoramic sense of this is a an unusual or unique environmental environmental region so if you look in and around ladakh for example in india you have three militaries contesting borders that were insufficiently mapped by colonial explorers and that didn't cohere to their understandings of where borders should be drawn the environment there didn't fit with how colonial cartographers assumed borders should work or how they should look and that is leading to this situation where you have three armies perched at incredibly high altitude all year round and that logic of militarizing those borders has followed through from the colonial period up to now getting worse and worse with the borders being more and more surveilled more and more human activity that has a huge local scale effects it also has a state level scale effects as well and if you can think about that particular region and compare it to other areas in the himalaya then it gives you a sense of how the region is unique and unusual it gives you points for comparison but it also enables you to think through how that system is functioning in the region as a whole i think that's incredibly useful as well and one of the things that you discuss in the book is to talk about slow violence how is it that the fact that there are three uh, state militaries perched on one of the highest glaciers perhaps one of the most ecologically sensitive regions of the himalaya what does that do not merely in terms of nuclear armed powers facing off one another at very high altitudes but also what is it doing for the regions uh, ecologies and for region culture so if you could speak a little bit more about what you mean by slow violence and why it's important to pay attention yeah it's a concept that comes from um rob nixon that it's been quite influential in in political ecology and environmental environmental studies more broadly so the main use of slow violence to understand the region is is useful because it it challenges the assumption which you find in international relations scholarship both more broadly and and in this region specifically that focuses on the region's questions of traditional violence sort of the opposite of slow violence fast violence i suppose you might say and so the question that i are asked is are the two most powerful states in the world going to go to war or not what are their troop positions um what does the effect of their nuclear arsenals have on their strategic calculus are they building roads to get access to border areas that they say they're going to get will either side of a conflict cross the line of control or the cross borders at, and in what context now these are obviously important questions so i i don't want to say that those aren't important questions but they're not the only question and ultimately what i think is playing out is that if you're asking are these three states going to go to war ultimately i think the answer is probably no 
India and China or India and Pakistan tensions, I think, are unlikely to lead to, to sort of all out war and conflict because the costs are too high. The sort of stultifying effect of each state's nuclear arsenals in the region means that states are unlikely to escalate conflicts. Um, a really good example of this is the Kargil conflict uh, between India and Pakistan about 20 years ago or so now. In that case, Indian troops used to withdraw from the higher posts in that in that region for the winter because it was too cold. And then they came back as the snow was melting to find Pakistani aligned soldiers in their posts, occupying their posts. India, that obviously started a, a war, a localized war in the region. Indian troops took back those posts, but they didn't send their bombers over the line of control and push push across into Pakistan territory. And this happened shortly after both states had sort of officially become nuclear states by, by testing nuclear weapons. So that tells us that strategically they are prepared to, to pull back. They don't escalate those smaller scale conflicts. But if you look at this from a slow violence perspective, then um, that conflict's been really significant, not in creating an all out war and conflict, but in slowly transforming the region in ways that I think can lead to just as catastrophic an ending as as all that conflict between those two or three nuclear armed powers would, would be. In the case of the Cargill conflict, you've instead seen the logic of militarizing those high peaks all year round as very directly as a result of what happened in with India withdrawing for winter. The Indians learned from this, never withdraw, <laughs> hold your posts all year round. Um, which maybe is the correct strategic lesson, but um, it's not a particularly helpful logic. You have that those borders being occupied all year round, contested constantly, surveilled constantly. You have more and more roads being built up to those borders on each side of the conflict. As each state builds more roads, the other state looking over the border says, why is that? Why are they building so many roads? Why are they sending their troops up there? What are they planning? And that provides more infrastructure building, more road building, more militarization. We don't really know what the result of that is ultimately going to be. Um, we've never had that many people occupying the high peaks of the Himalaya in human history. It just hasn't happened. We, we don't know what the environmental effects of that will be, but we can assume that they will likely be destructive or likely be negative. You'll have uh, more and more ice melts, you'll have more black carbon settling on ice caps, you'll have more dams being built to power militaries and states and the increase in human activity, that all of this is go is slowly degrading the regional environment. And at the same time, more militarization leads to more loss of local autonomy. I think we've seen that in Ladakh. It's very clearly the case in, in Tibet and across Tibet. I think it's also broadly the case in in the Pakistan Himalayas as well. And the slow environmental degradation, the slow loss of autonomy and the slow loss of cultural and potentially loss of traditional ecological knowledge as well, can, coupled with all of that infrastructure building, can facilitate or speed up environmental breakdown in the region, which I would argue can have just as catastrophic effects as, as violence that international relations is usually interested in. You know, just to build off of that, one of the problems that we discuss surely is the ecological degradation of state actors present there. But equally in your book, you discuss how it is that the environment can emerge as agentic actors in politics as well. So what does viewing mountains or rivers upon which you have militaries, upon which we're building dams, what does viewing them as agentic actors within geopolitics do for our understanding of the Himalaya? And what does it do for IR research that typically focuses on interstate relations and treats the environment almost like a container for politics or like a backdrop which is affected but not necessarily which has agency to affect geopolitics that um, another another really good question so i was i was i've been editing a, a special issue recently one of the papers went back to very early political science, political theorists, thinkers, you know, Hobbes, Locke and Kant, thinkers which have been foundational to Western political science and thought of as key to international relations thinking as well. They've sort of been held up as the core examples of our early IR realists or early IR liberals. And I hadn't I hadn't read those thinkers for probably since my undergraduate degree, if I'm if I'm honest. Maybe I read some of them in honest as well. Um so in over a decade. And it was really striking 
the way that the separation of humans from nature is the absolute first block of their theorizing. In the state of nature, man would do X, and then moving beyond that into societies is what takes us out of the state of nature. So the split between humans and nature is just at the bedrock of most Western political science and international relations theorizing. Um, the implication, of course, that, that pe peoples who advance into societies are separate from nature and people who haven't are still part of nature. And that's an extremely colonial way of thinking about human societies and development. And it's been used as a justification for colonialism over the over over centuries. It's core to the civilizing mission that our imperial thinkers thought they were going on. And I think you can kind of see it in, in development discourse today as well. And international relations still has that coloniality, I think, within a large bulk of its of its theorizing. The opposing the split of humans from nature has been key to a lot of environmental thought as well. So this is one of the really core theoretical divides between you know, environmental political theorizing critical green theorizing and traditional political science theorizing. I think the main shift that this makes for us is it shows us the entanglement between the environment and our politics. And a lot of theorists will tell you that this has been particularly intense since the Anthrop since the period of the Anthropocene started, since we became a really dominant geological force in the in the world. I mean not dominant but powerful one that we're transforming the planet really quite quite foundationally. But I think it goes back further than this. A really good example of this in the Himalaya is, is the creation of borders. The borders in the Himalaya are drawn at the most intense, difficult to inhabit environmental regions. They're drawn along the ridgelines of the highest peaks. They're drawn at frozen regions. They're drawn in, say, in Arunachal Pradesh. They're drawn where there's high altitude, muddy jungles that are really difficult for or people who aren't used to those regions to control and inhabit. But Himalayan communities have been adapted to living at those extreme environments for centuries. They have ways of life that are adapted to them. There are traditional bodies of knowledge that are really deeply enmeshed in those environments as well. And yes, at the most extreme high altitude points, there weren't permanent settlements, but there were just border points with high passes where communities could traverse and interact and sort of move up and down the mountains with the seasons. Human interactions with nature is what helped to create those borders. So if you think about the environment as being dynamic and influential, then you can start to understand that human interactions with, with natural environments and regions and narrations of how those functioned are responsible for why the borders have been drawn where where they are. And so that means that the environment was sort of always had an agential power in the political organization in the region. And I think that's more intense as human activity is transforming the planet more and more. But I think it's always been the case in the Himalaya that political organization and the region's environment were always dynamic and entangled with one another. And once you make that conceptual leap, you can start to rethink how politics in the environmental in that region function. Absolutely. And I think that also brings us to another aspect that you discussed, which is how do you uh, think about the region and govern the region beyond some of these state-based logics and to kind of really take into account these dynamic long-standing relationships. So one of the things that you discuss are regional uh, cooperation models that exist and that do, uh, that are developing um, to govern this region beyond existing state-based logics. What do you think are the promises, but also the challenges of regional cooperative initiatives within a highly territorialized and a highly militarized conception of the region? I, I think this goes back to the need for that multi-scalar analysis of the region and how those different scales connect. So I tend to be skeptical of regional cooperation as a simple answer to the region's problems, unless the forms of regional cooperation can transcend the state system in some way. It's not going to be as simple as building a Himalayan treaty organization with which those key state actors are the only members and then 
trying to get those them to agree not to, to contest. I don't think that's sufficient because international organisations can be dispossessing in local environments. Uh, they can be focused on the sort of dominant scientific rationalist way of understanding environmental regions. They can contribute to the loss of traditional or local environmental knowledge. And the state-based system in this region, I think, is ultimately at the core of the region's environmental and political troubles. So the kind of solutions that that leads to is the state, to some extent, receding from, from the mountain. Now, I quite often get critiqued for being overly idealistic at this point and, you know, just off theorizing with the fairies, right? <laughs> um, but <laughs> so I wouldn't, I'm not saying that the state <laughs> just, just disappears. <laughs> I'm saying that some of the elements of the state-based system that have particularly bad negative interactions with the environment and serve ultimately no purpose should be wound back. So that means deterritorializing ice caps, softening borders, enabling those sort of humans, cultural, ecological flows across the mountains to resume. It means having border points, this sort of old system of check posts along single mountain passes, rather than lineal borders in spaces that people aren't really going to cross anyway. <laughs> there are a lot of challenges involved in that kind of solution. So a regional cooperation model that incorporates local environmental knowledge, that incorporates sub-regional administrations, and that, that sort of rebuilds those historic connections that existed across the Himalaya before the rise of the, the state and the, the state's hard borders that can sort of bring those traditional ecological connections and human cultural connections back. There are obviously lots of challenges with this that are so obvious that I don't need to go over them, but states don't like these. All states in the region jealously guard their sovereignty. States in practice tend to remain the key actors in intergovernmental organisations. They don't tend to give up too much of their sovereignty in those types of organisations. They keep, keep the main, main decision-making powers for themselves. But there are still some precursors to this in the region that I think are quite bright spots to work with. So ISIMOD, the International Centre for Integrated Mountain Development, is one that already circulates a lot of scientific knowledge around the region. They tend just to pretend the border conflicts aren't there because they're too difficult, but I still think they do a lot of important work in sharing knowledge around the region and trying to transcend some of the problems that really tightly bordered region like the Himalaya, some of the ecological problems that that has created. And I sort of go through some of those in the book. I think the structure of that institution is something to work with or something to replicate or something to build off. And I think the next key step is integrating traditional knowledge and practices into political structures in the region. So there's some really good work from political ecology. I you give an example in the book from Anwesha Dutta and her colleague Shailendra Yashwan about still existing cross transboundary communities that practice localized forms of environmental governance that are much more effective than the state-based system where communication gets routed from a village to a regional center to the international capital to the other international capital and back to just where people are just managing the environment transboundary flows the way that they have for for centuries. Building those kinds of traditional ecological knowledge and practices into governmental organisations, I think, is something that's really promising. So I'm very aware of the difficulties in proposing these types of solutions. And states don't like these kinds of structures, but equally, boxing environmental regions into state actors does not work, is not functioning, and so it's important to propose those kinds of solutions. But empowering Himalayan communities politically and trying to transcend the state-based logic of the region is the ultimate goal of this kind of discussion and this kind of organisation. Because this conversation also raises a lot of the methodological interventions that the book makes, and I want to kind of shift gears and talk a little bit about that as well. The work in your book is informed by traditional IR methods, for sure, like in terms of analysis of government documents, but equally it's informed by your field research as well. So what do you think uh, are the possibilities for ethnography uh, within IR? And could you talk a little bit about your field research? This is a good I don't feel it's super qualified to, to answer this question in some ways. So I wouldn't have written the book in, in the form that I had if I could have done more fieldwork. 
I wrote it after a, a three year postdoc, which was the main topic for, at, at La Trobe University. I was able to visit the region there quite often, several times, but I wasn't thinking I'm going to go and write a book about the region. I was thinking I'm going to go and build collaborative networks. I'm going to work with my colleagues from other disciplines. Ruth Gamble, who's an environmental historian, Gerald Roach, who's a is an anthropologist, um, Lauren Gorn, who's a linguist. I'm going to go build connections, so build momentum for for research collaborations. But I was able to go. I think I went to the region three or four times, about a month each time, going to places um, mostly in India at this point. Arunachal, Sikkim, Ladakh, these kinds of places, and spend a couple of weeks at a time. Now, I think that's more than most IR people would go to these regions. I would mostly go to Delhi or Beijing or deal with think tanks or try and hang out with foreign policy elites and see what they're thinking. <laughs> um, but I'm sure an, an anthropologist would laugh at, like, oh, you wrote a book after three months of field work. That's pathetic. <laughs> Um, so I haven't done, I don't think I have done ethnography. I have traveled to border regions in the capacity as a, as a researcher or kind of as a tourist at the same time. So I've built off other people's ethnographies of borderland communities in particular, rather than doing a massive amount of fieldwork myself. I was lucky to be able to go back. I spent, so I wrote most of this book in Perth. Perth had the most intense border closures in the world through COVID. So I was, I'd been traveling constantly for years, right? And then come to Perth in January, 2020 to start my first ongoing job. And they shut the national borders, then they shut the state borders, they shut the state border um, with, with the rest of Australia for over two years. So I've stuck. So my own field work isn't as deep as I might have liked it to be. And instead I supplemented what I did with scientific papers, policy discourse. There's some amazing historical research that's been done on the region lately. I think there's really strong possibilities for ethnographies in, in international relations. I think some of that work has been done in borderland studies, but yeah, I, I don't, my own experiences of field work were stopped by those border closures. And then when you're in India, they're sort of constant applying for permits and getting stuck by roadworks, like all those things really slow it down. It's a difficult region to, to do field work. Um, what are your thoughts about possibilities of ethnography in, in international relations? No, I, I think it's fascinating. Like, you know, it, it's exactly what you said, right? Like within IR, field work isn't necessarily a tool or a methodological intervention that we use. So even small bursts of field work enrich the analysis so much more than if you were engaging merely with a say a Delhi or an Islamabad or a Beijing perspective of the borders. And I think it's so important to think about how the state appears or how the state is conjured in the borders which it governs. Because on the one hand, these are jealously guarded regions, but we also know historically these have been regions where the state's presence has been at best contingent, at best fractured. And there is that deep desire to project a close territory in the face of an ambiguous history and I feel like ethnography or even qualitative research really like field research gives us avenues and possibilities to really interrogate how the state emerges as an actor and what the state uh, does when it envisions a territory and seeks to create that territory for itself and to me that's the most exciting part of um qualitative field research, whether it's ethnographic or whether it's employing qualitative tools to analyze the region. And I'm with you, I feel that COVID has really slowed a lot of this research down in a region that's already very difficult to traverse, that's already governed by a whole lot of uh, paperwork. <laughs> but I, I really think that um, you know we have a lot to learn as a discipline from the work that's happening in the Himalayan borderlands from uh, that that's taken an anthropological lens or that's taken a political geography lens which looks at that region uh, coming at it from a different angle to really ask the same questions about power about sovereignty about governing at heights from the plains and I feel like interdisciplinarity and interdisciplinary conversations to my mind are the future for IR as well because there are limitations to coming at this region merely from uh, from this uh, from the plains or from a capital city perspective. It limits 
how much uh, we can engage with that discourse. And equally, it limits our own approach to how that discourse is produced. Like, how does Delhi view the borders? Is something that a qualitative uh, field research perspective can really enhance our analysis of how that capital city discourse itself is produced as well. Yeah, you can get a lot of, like some of the historical work I mentioned does a, an incredible job of showing how India's post-colonial diplomats and foreign policy elites were imagining and engaging with borderland spaces. And that, like, Bernice Goyorashad, um, Ruth Gamble, Thomas Simpson, there's, I'm, I know I'm forgetting some names, um, have done some really exceptional historical work on on how those borders were constructed and how local communities engaged with the state through that process of decolonization. And it becomes clear from that that some of them experience an increase in, in external control and influence on over their day-to-day -day lives than uh, through the period of decolonization, which is really interesting and should be really challenging for us in, in general. More than that, how is that relationship still being produced? How is that still happening in the present as the state takes more and more influence over the more extreme regions of the Himalaya. That is something that you can't necessarily get the internal thoughts of the state apparatus in India or China or Pakistan because there's so much secrecy attached to these kinds of things. Uh, if you can draw on existing ethnographic scholarship or go and do some of that ethnographic scholarship yourself, then you can get to the contemporary ways in which borderland communities are negotiating their relationship with the state and the ongoing process of bordering, which I think is just a super exciting and interesting field of research and can be really enriching for, for international relations as well. I completely agree. And, you know, like you said a little bit uh, towards the beginning of our conversation as well, post-colonial IR is doing some of this recovery of colonial histories of borders that are often bracketed away in contemporary analysis of geopolitics. And I feel like these, appro these methodological approaches can really help us push the conceptual interventions forward as well. Talk about how it, how it is that colonial histories continue to influence post-colonial state policies and post-colonial approaches to the border, as well as borderland communities' interactions with the states on both sides of the borders, as um, both uh, Bernice and uh, Ruth's work very evocatively demonstrate in their different uh, domains as well. Kyle Gardner, that's who I was thinking Kyle of. Gardner, no, my yeah, apologies to Kyle if he's listening. <laughs> yeah. The frontier complex is also enormously mm. useful within this domain. I well, that kind of brings me to another aspect. Uh, you know, you think about international political ecology also as as a prescriptive research agenda. And one of the things that you discuss is the need for collaborative research between academics and local communities. And you spoke about it a little while back as well in terms of um, integrating traditional local knowledges within our understanding of politics. So I want to ask you how. How do we do that? How does that work? And how do you ne negotiate some of the dominant epistemic hierarchies that really exist that cast us as researchers and local communities often as respondents rather than collaborators? And how do we negotiate some of these dynamics and these hierarchies to really create equal research collaborations that hold space for voices of local communities? And how do you see this being operationalized within a discipline like IR that places so much emphasis on the you know, foreign policy elites, so to speak. What does this do for the discipline and why is this so significant? When I'm, when I'm in the fields working with colleagues from other disciplines, I tend to just have this feeling of being the least useful person there. <laughs> um, and so I have the least to offer communities that we're engaging with. That is something that I reflect on quite a lot. Um, I'm going to give an example from a special issue that I've been working on in, in the Australian context. It's on the possibilities of decolonizing international relations study in Australia. One of the things that emerged from that project is that there's very few Indigenous people engaging with Australian international relations debates because partly due to the coloniality of the discipline, but I think mostly because our issues and debate don't speak to Indigenous communities' issues and debates because we just take the 
state as the actor, we take that for granted, we try and talk to foreign policy elites, and that means that Indigenous voices in Australia very rarely reach mainstream international relations debates. That's thankfully starting to shift. We're seeing some interesting research emerging over the last few years. International relations debates don't tend to speak to local community, borderland community, marginalised communities, Indigenous communities, concerns and issues. So that's something that, that we really desperately need to work on. So it's hard to operationalise that in international relations without changing international relations in the first place. And I sort of go back to IR's colonial origins in, in explaining that. So it's difficult to overcome. I think, and I'm keen to get your thoughts on this as well, because I, I don't think I, I have all the answers on this. I think it requires really long-term friendship building across institutions. I find when I'm in the region, I don't talk that much. I mostly listen. I think it requires approaching communities that you that you want to work with, approaching them with a really strong sense of of humility. I think it requires working with young and emerging researchers from those communities. It means co-publishing with them. It means helping people get into top journals so they can build careers and that doing that sort of work. But this is this is difficult to, to overcome. How how do you feel? You know, I ask this because it's coming from a place of being angst for myself as well, because I don't know how to negotiate some of these academic hierarchies, especially when they're so deeply entrenched. And somewhere I feel like I I'm on the other side in a very different context. And it's it makes me wonder what it does for me as an academic when I'm cast as the respondent in a different context. And I often wonder, are there possibilities really for equal research? And I'm with you. I think the the least that, that we can do and the starting point really is to listen and is to hold a space of empathy and compassion for the people we work with and find ways for equal research collaboration, where, whether it's authorship, whether it's events, whether it is finding ways to really invest in local institutions, for instance, just some of the ideas. But I also think it's hard, but it's so necessary for us as academics in general, but also especially within a discipline like IR, where you, like you very rightly said, the concerns of the communities aren't necessarily the concerns that are reflected in existing policy debates or in existing theorizations within IR. So there's also a lot of, I think, recasting of the discipline that's necessary and a lot of that kind of churning within the discipline that we need. And we're not going to see it unless we have more Indigenous scholars within the discipline who are challenging the existing hierarchies on the one hand and on the other, uh, members of the community, uh, members of the IR scholarship community who are willing to be challenged and who are willing to really be asked these questions and reflect on the ways in which colonial hierarchies persist in disciplines uh, to date. Just, you know, preliminary thoughts, but I didn't have any answers either, which is why I posed the question to you in the first place. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's a it's a really difficult question to answer, and I I don't I don't think any one person should claim to have the answer to that question. I, I mostly think of it as so sort of decolonizing a discipline is a struggle to be worked towards, and you don't necessarily know what the end point is going to be or what it's going to look like. So it is something that you've got to work towards over, over a career, over a lifetime, just trying to push the boundaries as much as you can. In the context of the Himalaya, I think the best things to do are to try to co-publish with communities, try to build long-term research connections, create opportunities for emerging scholars whenever you can, especially from my marginalized communities trying to make sure IR's debates and issues that actually speak to them. Like we said earlier on, like, this is some of the most exciting research opportunities in international. Some of the best work that's being done is is linking IR with border studies and um, ethnographies. Trying to bring those voices out is really central to that work and shifting the way that IR produces, produces knowledge. That is a longer term struggle. That is very extremely difficult to do. But um, yeah, that that's one step on the road to, to doing that. Yeah, 
and I think I agree with you. This is a long-term project that requires consistent and continued commitment on our part as researchers towards this as not merely an academic but also a political project of uh, engendering greater equality and centering voices of the Himalaya rather than from the, writing about the Himalaya from the plains. I think that you know speaks to a larger academic project as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for making the time to speak with the Betscapes today. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be engaging with the Betscapes and I'm looking forward to, to working with you guys more over the next few years as well.